further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ronan, who's going to take us through uh, microservices. Thank you very much. Um, I, I can talk quite loud anyway. Um, so, I'm going to open with some questions. Uh, how many people know what a microservice is? That's good. Cracking stuff. <laughs> right. Oh, no. First things first. You, you've got to get your food in, otherwise you'll be tired and exhausted by the end of the talk or something. I, I like to think it's slightly mentally taxing. I... Henry... <laughs> yes. Well, there's been a lot of talk about microservices. Uh, around the internet. Those guys like to talk. Um, and I set about trying to find out what one was, what all the fuss was about, and I still haven't really settled on a definition that really works for me. Um, mostly it seems to be an extension of SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. And how many people in the room does that mean something to? Excellent. I'm not going to be out here on my own then. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, a microservice is, to me, the extension of SOA into the modern age in a similar way to the way uh, a, an automated testing approach and a unit testing approach uh, led to the TDD methodology where you would write all of your tests first and go very extreme about it all. Microservices is a very extreme version of SOA. Um, but SOA itself is quite a broad topic, so the variety of extremes is quite uh, diverse. There's a lot of ways you can take this. And now I'm going to see what my uh, next slide is. Yes, it basically says these things. We're microservices, it's a design pattern. A design pattern is always uh, a classification of something we've seen happen in practice that we're trying to ascribe name to so that we can uh, define it, recognize it when we see it, and work out what characteristics to expect when we've seen it. And SOA hasn't really changed. You're still encapsulating all of the um, dependencies and uh, properties of a process in a service. You get to it through a service endpoint. That's all you need to know. You've got the, let's go with web services for now. You've got the URL for this endpoint. That's all you need. You can make requests and get data out. So, we do that, we take it to an extreme, and we see what we come up with. Normally through experimentation, because that's how we do things. Uh, microservices as a collective concept, they're always collections of individual services. I think I have managed to land on a definition of a microservice, which I'm comfortable with. But for microservices as a whole, I don't think it really makes sense to try to nail down a definition for the collection. Um, uh, jump ahead. So, a service. Service is an SOA service. You get an isolated uh, unit of functionality that will do a particular job. Um, it will do it in a way that's completely decoupled from anything else. You'll be able to... Um, patch it into any other uh, piece of software that's capable of communicating with the service and thoroughly encapsulates everything. Anything outside of that um, service uh, communication protocol is a big no-no. It's out-of-band traffic, it's not allowed, and it's going to break your encapsulation. 
and it's going to cause horrible, horrible disasters when you come to uh, take the thing to an extreme because any minor problem amplifies into an extreme problem. As soon as you have one service that starts using the disk as uh, a storage location rather than, uh, sorry, not as a storage, as a back channel communication between two services, say you have um, a user with a, a, a profile picture, you can't have everyone go to the disk to get that. You've got to get it through the service, otherwise your encapsulation's broken, you don't get to take advantage of most of the good points. Um, so, on to taking SOA to extremes. Um, isolation, one of the things that SOA can provide. You get to isolate um, a microservice from any performance concerns of anything it's dealing with you. If you are writing a service which calls out to a remote system that takes an hour to respond, that's fine. That was built into your application. That would be completely intolerable. You'd have to go through lots of extra coding to deal with that specifically. Um, microservices is an environment where you've got all of that in place already. Everything is all, always created as a service. You get to isolate yourself from any performance concerns of bad algorithms. You get any uh, isolation from any storage requirements of um, other uh, services. So if you are writing the user profile service that returns the user profile, then you don't have to worry about the picture. The profile is just a name, a date of birth, and address, maybe. You return those things in one document. That's your job. You don't need to worry about anything else. Querying, that's a completely different system. You have one service whose job is to take an ID and return you a document with all the data in. And another service whose job is to take a single datum and return you a list of IDs. It's kind of an extreme of command query responsibility segregation as well. But let, let's stick with the SOA view on it. You, and there's a list of other things you get to isolate your self from. Um, this point here, isolation drives focus. Really like this one. If you find yourself building a system which only stores a mapping from user ID to the three or four pieces of data that you need to return, then you are never going to get any nasty bits of code mixed in with that. Nothing to do with pictures is going to leak in because it's not even remotely useful to do so. It's running in a different process, potentially on a different OS, different machine. You don't know or care. It keeps you focused. Your code will be targeted to one thing. And when your code only does one thing, it's much more reusable. We've, I mean, all the programmers amongst us will have come across pieces of code they've tried to reuse. And it just doesn't work if the code does more than one thing. Uh, if you've got code that does one thing, one thing only, then you need that thing, you use it. You don't need that thing, you use something else. Splitting the two responsibilities into two different bits of code really boosts reusability which is kind of an un unsubstantiated claim at this point, but I believe it and I'm going to keep claiming it's uh, an advantage. Um, I'm now suddenly being struck by the idea that I've written extreme loose coupling in large letters on a projector, but let's move past that quickly. Um, the, the loose coupling in SOA is mostly um, a product of going through a service protocol to get to your data or to your end result. You don't necessarily need to have data coming back, but that's just a particular kind of service. Um, traditionally, um, RPC and web services have been uh, common uh, go-to technologies for SOA. Um, various messaging technologies like 0MQ and RabbitMQ are quite common in the microservice space at the moment. Uh, you only need one URL to hook your service into all of the other services. Then you transfer your data modeling requirement into the messaging layer. And 
if you do that, then you end up with a very difficult job of trying to design your data model properly. But if you do, then you end up with a lot of potential for functionality you didn't foresee. If you define your basic messages as um, very, very simple events and your, uh, your data models and um, documents that you transfer as uh, fairly primitive representations of uh, small resources, then uh, you can see a lot of functionality emerge that you might not have expected to emerge. Um, probably one of the best examples of that I can throw out is going to be uh, designing a game with microservices, which is going to be a horribly uh, unperformant way of doing it. But if you have a uh, the concept of a collidable object, concept of a location in space, you can then have a service that's responsible for tracking any movement event. Uh, neat separation of verbs and nouns going on there. That's part of the data modeling idea. Uh, if you have um, movement events tracked by a collision coordinator, which then tracks two things moving into the same space via a collision event, then you just need your um, collision detection program to say, when object X collides with anything, then object X is destroyed. And you then start throwing bullets into the game, then your character runs into a tree and evaporates. Not always desirable behavior, but something you didn't foresee in a very strict interpretation of your rules, which you might not have seen coming, which is interesting. And then OTP, uh, the uh, open uh, telecom platform. Um, I thought I'd throw that in there. It's um, uh, an integral part of the Erlang VM. You, it, it's a messaging platform, and it seems to me like that's a natural extension beyond uh, a, a more formal messaging system for uh, a service architecture. Essentially, an Erlang process is a service. And more and more these days, I keep coming back to the idea that Erlang has been doing a lot of things right before the rest of the world caught up. Um, and you can use any combination of these that you like. You, as long as you've got a service that does one thing, that's a microservice. It's small, does one thing, service, that's a microservice. You can then weave them together into any obscure system you like. If you have a, a number of small components interacting with RPC, and then you have another component that translates that RPC into a web service layer, each of those can be considered a microservice. Um, the web service front with everything behind it can be considered an SOA platform. There's a lot of room for the terms to get blurred here. So I think that's a good point to stop talking about it and move on. Um, extreme implementation abstraction. Um, what does that even mean? Good question. Um, I'm not really sure myself, but once you're abstracted from uh, your implementation and don't care what it is, who cares if you've got two different implementations? You keep swapping between them at random. You put 5% of your users onto one of them and use the 95% as a benchmark for how this new piece of code is working. Your, your wackier prototypes start to become more feasible. You start to be able to weave in code that's only been in existence for two weeks, drop that into production, because if it's not working, you can just take it out again. You know there's another piece of code that does the same job correctly that's been proven to work. You throw in a higher performance prototype. It will either work properly and faster or will be slower or won't work and you take it out. Um, if anyone has any ideas, I, I would really like uh, if you could... I'm sure there's more behind this. Um, the abstraction from implementation is 
always a powerful concept in computing. You, um, when you don't have to care how something's done, and you just know that you can make it happen, then you are free to deal with a lot more of your own um, domain problems, which is what you're really sitting down to do anyway. And I'm sure there's more capability in there. So if anyone can think about what that might be, then. Could you have a large web application that would need 100 or so microservices, then put, say, 10 of them on each mobile phone within a one mile radius, and then the web application is actually running on 10 mobile phones. And as you go from area to area, you'll have a kind of cross section of, you'll have maybe 50 mobile phones and 10 of those would have the bits you want. It's very much like torrenting a file, but instead we're torrenting bits, packets, which are functionality for the web application that we're all running live on your own but device. Could you do that? That does sound like a really good idea. There we go. You <laughs> see, kind of work our way to do that. It's beautiful. Well, you implement a messaging layer and throw out messages. It's reasonably easy. That's a great idea. You, you could also uh, use a similar architecture to, divine a, to uh, devise a uh, group navigation feature for some kind of quadcopter. What should get Wi-Fi on the London Underground? <laughs> that, uh, I, I'm not sure that's entirely a software problem. Um, no, but I mean if you can carry the Wi-Fi from above ground and then route it through. Oh, yeah. so, so you, you're using uh, people carrying phones around as your IP layer yeah. and then building. To, that, that could work. Your latency would be awful, but. something this architecture lends itself very well to. Um, however, if that's not what you want to do, then this kind of architecture can cause you problems, um, mostly in the form of the upfront costs you have to pay to make it work, which you then just don't get any benefits of. There are a significant number of upfront costs in trying to run a microservice system, um, which uh, I've got slides about later. Um, it's Oh. Uh, it would. Uh, you've got the communication overhead, you've got the networking stuff, uh, you've got some kind of either advertising or discovery cost, um, depending on your approach. Um, the characteristics will uh, diverge quite a lot once you've picked um, a messaging-based system or an HTTP uh, document transfer-based uh, system as your communication protocol, um, which, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that could be called microservices and the definition doesn't really have to be nailed down to a particular protocol or anything. Um, I, I do believe a lot more useful definitions will come out of different areas once certain combinations of these have proved themselves to be useful then those combinations will get names, even if they're fairly useless names, like Web 2.0. But, you know, we, we could be seeing the birth of Web 3.7 here. You remember this day. Uh, yes, um, encapsulation of dependencies. I've kind of touched on this as one of the things that SOA offers. You, you don't care what OS something's running on. You don't care what frameworks are required to make a particular piece work one thing requires you to install Ruby on Rails and your 400 gems of which 200 are actually the same gem in different versions or whatever crap that is. Just hide it, put it in a VM, run it, make it work, then hide it behind a service endpoint. It, it's a good approach to getting rid of a lot of the stuff we don't want to see. And once you've done that, it gives you a lot of freedom to build the rest of the system the way you want rather than letting this cripple your, um, your actual architecture. And a lot of this is a lot more feasible now than it was 10 years ago when SOA was starting because it's a lot cheaper to start a new VM. I can, 
I could get a VM for the day with 30 CPUs and 24 gigs of RAM in it, a 100 meg internet pipe, it cost a few dollars for the day, it'd be ready in 60 seconds. That's the kind of stuff that you just couldn't do 10 years ago. And that's the kind of stuff that's changing what SOA is. So the core ideals, still very much SOA. The new stuff, still quite new. Still working out how they fit together. Um, me and the rest of the world, apparently. So, as with every design pattern, you want some diagnostic criteria to know if what you're looking at is microservices, which it turns out is not a very useful question because you can have big services, small services, small ones that only do one job, fair to call one of those a microservice. When you've got a larger system, you, you're very rarely going to find that every service within a large system is a microservice. You're going to find that you've got some small components which are designed to interact in a very fluid, very loosely coupled way. Then uh, at the outside, you'll have some larger systems. Say you've got to work with, you've got to send emails out. You've got to send that out to a mail exchanger which has got to take care of your relaying outwards. And the mail exchanger, that's a piece of software that exists already. Um, whether it counts as part of your microservice or as your SOA system or not uh, is kind of subjective, but uh, where you draw the boundaries of your system and any other system is always going to be subjective in an age where you can get gigabyte of traffic from the States in 10 minutes. Um, you've got two minutes left. Okay, so uh, yeah, you, you can have a microservice or more inside large monoliths. That is not a complicated concept. So we move on to, is this one thing a microservice? Um, first off, it's got to be service. Um, got to have a service contract. Got to have a very well-defined service contract. It's one of the big costs, but it's where most of the benefits come from. And does it do one job? If it does two things, then I wouldn't call it a microservice. And the, the definition of one job is, again, arguable. Um, if you are building uh, an open ID server, then validating a user's password and returning their name and email address would be separate concepts. Uh, you, they, those would be separate jobs you would have um, different uh, network traffic profiles for each of them. You would have uh, different numbers of requests for each of them. You'd want to be able to scale them differently, model their performance differently. And again, I think if it's reusable, that's a good guideline for it having one job. If you could reuse it, if you want that job done, that makes it a thing that does one job for you. So the costs, service contracts. There are lots of service contracts. You have to define what the input and output format of each service is, what data it sends back and forth, um, which means defining the document, defining the data formats within it, whole lot of work there. Um, configuration management. You, when you deploy uh, a system of 200 services, that's gonna be a lot of work. Um, Ideally, you want that work to be done by code, but then you've got to write that code in advance. Um, and being able to use tools like Puppet and Chef to roll out 200 different copies of the same service or take one of your 40 core services and scale that up from 10 to 50 machines, that's the kind of thing that you can get with modern configuration management tools that start to make some of this wackier stuff a lot more feasible. And you've got to build your publishing frameworks and all of the code which sits around your services which enables you to write another service very quickly. Um, if you're going to write 200 of them, you want a bit of an upfront cost to make it very cheap to write each individual one. 
otherwise you're going to run out of developer time before you get any project finished. Um, and service-oriented data model design is very difficult. Uh, designing a, a data model which exists primarily in a messaging framework is a very difficult thing to do. Um, ask any experienced Erlang programmer, um, of which I'm not one. Don't ask me difficult questions about Erlang. I'll get there, but not today. Um, and then there's uh, latency and overheads that you get from running everything through the network. That should be fairly obviously expensive. But you get a lot of benefits. You get to uh, keep everything nasty in its own little box, regardless of why it's nasty. You had to hack a fix in. Your fix gets hacked in, the thing works, and it doesn't have horrible performance knock-ons for other systems on the other side of the world, data center, other side of the CPU, wherever. Uh, upgrades get simpler. You, each service has a well-defined contract. You honor that contract. You can change whatever you like behind it. Um, similarly with the substitutability, um, writing bespoke code for a particular customer gets a lot easier when it's only a small module you have to swap out when you have to do a complete new build of the whole application. That gets uh, a lot more expensive, more management overhead, more branches in version control to merge. Scalability, when everything's a service, it's fairly easy to slot a load balancer in. Oh. Uh, your choice of uh, communication protocol will make a difference there course but generally it will become easier and your systems can evolve and do things that you never expected that's more a property of the um, zero MQ rabbit MQ kind of Erlang end of the scale um, not that there's even really a linear scale but you can get systems doing things that you didn't think possible which you then have to make them carry on doing or stop doing depending on whether they turn out to be desirable. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think I'll cover these in reverse. Um, feedback driven products where you're observing for uh, new emergent behavior, working out if you want it, if you don't, pruning it or um, letting it grow. Um, latency I've covered. Good programmers, you need good programmers to build a, a service-oriented data model because that's difficult. Um, solving unsolved problems. When you don't know what you're going to do when you set out, you'll write a piece of software, solves one small piece of the problem, and provides an interface that will plug into anything else you come up with. That's a good way to go about prototyping a system. Trying to build it as a monolith is bad. Conversely, if you know exactly what you want up front, then trying to build it piecemeal is probably unproductive and going to take you longer. Um, and homogeneous data. If you've got few data types, your services are a lot more composable. If you've got uh, an order processing system where you have to bring orders in and store them somewhere, you have to validate the orders, you have to send them off for stock checking, you have to split them up to different suppliers, uh, then send the orders out to those suppliers to be fulfilled, track data coming back. If the data going through at every stage is an order, then you can reuse a lot of your service contract work between your services. That kind of reuse starts to make the uh, work of building a service architecture a uh, lot more fruitful. Last minute. last minute. We're up to the last few slides. Um, the, uh, and they don't work if you're in the opposite situation to the previous slide. Um, ob obviously, this isn't really clear cut. Sometimes you'll have some green flags and red flags. You've got to make a call. If you're not applying your intelligence to the whole process, then I can't help you. Um, uh, any questions? I stuck to the time quite well. <laughs>